Right. Good afternoon, comrades. Uh, I'm Risto Turunen from Tampere University, and I'm writing my PhD of history at the moment. So one part of this PhD, uh, I'm using uh, newspapers, like Jani said there before. So I want to start with this photo. This is a great symbolic photo from 1899. This is uh, from the print house of the first socialist newspaper in Finland. So what's happening in this photo? Well, uh, the authorities in Finland have shut down electricity, but these working men, uh, they are not scared. They are printing this issue by muscle force instead. So I put this photo just to remind myself, mainly myself, that behind these PDF uh, files and text files, there are always these real people made of flesh and bone. So it's not only text that this newspaper were born as. So, and in 1907, in Finland, we had the biggest socialist party of whole Europe. So it's one of these uh, classical questions, questions of Finnish history writing. How did socialism come to Finland? And I, I want to approach this question from the language perspective, because now we have all these newspapers in the digital form, so we can use some new digital tools to analyze this huge phenomenon. So, like Annie said, we have all of them. That means that we have about 2.4 billion word tokens in this corpus. And we have two pretty good uh, interfaces to study these. Both are good for some purposes. But, of course, the problem with interfaces is that you always have some question that cannot be answered by these interfaces. So it's uh, super nice that the Nas National Library of Finland uh, allows to download this whole corpus uh, in different formats. Uh, I'm not very good with computers, so I usually uh, use just the plain text files uh, with different uh, corpus linguistic programs like AntConc or Wordsmith. So, so far uh, I have used uh, at least three, three good methods in, in this project. Uh, raw frequencies or uh, frequency lists, they, they are very simple to create, but uh, I think they are very effective as well. So I, I, might, I might ask my computer, like, show me the top 500 uh, words in the, all the socialist newspapers. And I get a lot of inf information from this, this simple list. And uh, let's say that I find that socialist newspaper uh, everywhere in Finland are using the word freedom very, very frequently. Then I can zoom in to this uh, word or concept by looking at its collocates. Uh, collocates, as uh, was mentioned before, uh, mean the linguistic context in which this word is appearing. So. For example, freedom in the socialist language, it's very often with terms such as struggle and workers. So what does it mean? Well, in my interpretation, it means that in the socialist discourse, freedom is achieved through a struggle. You have to fight for freedom. It doesn't drop from the heaven when the worker uh, is born. And these uh, workers, why is it there? Well, it's collective freedom. It's, it belongs to the workers. And it's very interesting to study then the non-socialist newspapers as well and see how they are using freedom. They are using the same word, but they mean basically a different concept completely. So comparing collocates is very, very good uh, method for me. And then there is this keyness method, meaning that I can compare, uh, let's say, I can compare agrarian socialist newspapers to all the newspapers, to all the social, socialist newspapers. And then I can see if these agrarian socialists are more aggressive than uh, the other socialists. And I can also see uh, what concepts uh, socialists are using much more often than bourgeois people who are living in the same society at the same time, but they have a completely different language. So, uh, 
I, I was very happy with uh, Andrew's uh, software he was presenting uh, earlier today because it had all of these uh, features included. Because our interfaces, for example, that are in available in Finland at the moment, don't have, let's say, the keyness method in it. So that's what I have, have found so far. Thank you. Thanks. Any, um, any questions for the, either of, or both of our uh, Finnish colleagues? Does anybody else use desktop tools like Anfong and um, WordSmith? Yeah, so these are, if you don't know, these are things that can do similar functionality to what um, Andrew uh, demonstrated on an uh, online server, which you can do on your, on your desktop. Um, Antgonk, at least, is free. Uh, I recommend it for many purposes. Yeah, I, I, my Antgonk is crashing with more than two billion words, so I, otherwise it would be good. Yeah, so uh, in, in the first presentation, uh, I think it was a nice example of the Moretti style uh, kind of reading, but I actually want to comment on your stuff because I totally agree with you. I'm also interested in things that are relatively simple for NLP people, mm. can give you a lot of information uh, sort of on the conceptual domain, mm. let's say. But uh, I'm just going to ask you a question because uh, my colleague here doesn't ask it, but that's usually how he uh, challenges me. Is so when you, when you do this kind of work, whether you actually process uh, process your corpus and uh, you know do lemmatization, which I would imagine would be very important, for example in Finnish and stuff. So whether there's some prep work or whether you just work with a plain text as you download it, because it could actually be to the point that it might affect some uh, results. Yeah. Well, uh, we have. The, the two interfaces and uh, another of them is very like very linguistical orientated so you can lemmatize with uh, this interface if you want to. I, I don't know <laughs> because uh, sometimes it doesn't matter the word form and and I guess uh, different word forms might have different meanings as well so it might be in, important to study them in different word forms than to always lemmatize them. I don't know if you get it, but... but so if, if, I can, if I can ask a question, D don't you find that like, your, your list of word frequencies would be rather misleading if you don't, if you, you know, with, with a highly inflected language like Finnish, you know, lots of the proper names might come up to the top and you know, verbs will be further down? I don't know. It's, the stuff I have seen so far, uh, it has been useful. And when you compare let's say, socialist words to non-socialist words, then they, they are in the same form. Like, there are different f forms in both of the texts, so I don't see the problem yet. So, just a clarification. So, when you s spoke about the comparison of uh, collocations of, uh, of the f word freedom mm. um, in socialist, non-socialist yeah. uh, newspapers, so you actually meant uh, freedom in singular, uh, yes. And so basically, this one word form, not uh, with freedom, about freedom, freedoms. Uh, no, no, I just pop up in the Finnish. Yeah. Okay. Time for one more uh, follow-up question on that from the front here. Sorry. I really like your topic. Uh, I would suggest uh, going beyond uh, content word analysis and would recommend also to research the proportion of uh, adjectives used in socialist and non-socialist discourse, uh, how long this, the, the sentences are, or maybe even uh, the um, grammatical words, like for example, socialist text might be using much more first person plural, like we, 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 mm -hmm. and they, the other side would be more about, you know, independence, like individual. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting, and I should do that. I've, I've done a little bit of that. So I'm studying personal pronouns, for example. So, for example, in the socialist newspapers, what is the most common noun that comes after we? Well, it's we the socialist. <laughs> and in the bourgeois papers, it's uh, we, the na we the Finns. So, 
it tells you a lot about identities they are trying to build in these newspapers. Good, thank you very much. We should um, move on.